Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, today to today's uh, ETM Distinguished Speaker Series event. Uh, this is a special event. I want to welcome everybody here. Um, a couple of things. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that are taking this for ET as ETM 507 for uh, uh, credit. Maybe there will be a speaker report as usual. It'll be posted up. Um, and all the same stuff as usual for that. Uh, the other uh, part is our format is a little different in here. We have we have a great speaker, and um, he likes having a conversation rather than a presentation and slide. So he has a, uh, a, a, a format that is very conducive to that and very productive. We also have a special co-host or moderator today. Uh, Dr. Bill Dresselhaus and Dr. Bill Dresselhaus and uh, Don Norman are long friends that we've, um, and it, that's how we got uh, the opportunity to have Don as our speaker today. Um, Bill Dresselhaus has been teaching in the ETM department for years with a very popular series of pair of classes, human-centered design and um, user-centered design, as well as user-centered innovation. User-centered innovation is being offered in the summer for credit as a graduate class. If you're interested in these kinds of topics and you're at PSU, that's a great opportunity to explore that uh, deeper as well. Um, without further ado, I want to turn it over to um, our uh, moderator, Bill Dresselhaus, to introduce our speaker and, um, and to explain how things will run. And so uh, on behalf of the entire Portland State Engineering and Technology Management Department, welcome everyone. I do wanna say this has set a record. Our meetup group has never had an event with over a hundred people before. And last I checked, we were at 117. So, so that's amazing, best turnout we've ever had. And I've already heard from the uh, chairs of other engineering departments at PSU, Oh, I wish I could show up. I, I so want to be here to hear Don's talk. I've got the book on my bookshelf. Um, and so uh, once again, thanks everyone. And we will go ahead and get started. So, um, okay. And so without further ado, take it away, Dr. Dresselhaus. Okay, great. Hi, Don. Glad to see you again. Hi, Bill. Um, so, of course, we are very privileged to have with us today Donald Norman, Dr. Donald Norman. Uh, he is the Distinguished Professor Emeritus of uh, Cognitive Science and Psychology, uh, and also the uh, Emeritus Founder of the Design Lab, both at the University of California at San Diego. He has uh, three honorary degrees besides his master's in electrical engineering and PhD in neuroscience. Uh, he's been rated by Business Week as one of the most uh, influential designers in the world. Uh, I've used his book, D The Design of Everyday Things, for about six years now in my course at ETM. And uh, we've corresponded several times about a number of things. He's written many books on uh, design. And uh, today, this is the one we're going to be talking about, Design for a Better World and uh, Meaningful, Sustainable, and Humanity-Centered. So I'm going to be uh, looking at questions uh, for Don from the uh, chat uh, monitor over here. But I'm going to start out by, well, so welcome, Don. Uh, I'm going to start out by giving you, a, uh, starting out with a question here. Uh, to start off, Don, why don't you give us a little overview of your new book, Design for a Better World, and why did you write it? So, anyway, greetings, everybody. I'm delighted to be in Portland. Probably better weather than we have in San Diego today. It's cold in San Diego. Um, well, I started off as an engineer two degrees in electrical engineering, um, and accidentally became a psychologist because I had, what, what happened was that I really wanted to do computers. 
And I went to the University of Pennsylvania because that's where the first computers were developed in the United States, the ENIAC computer. But nobody there was doing computers. And they kept saying, well, we stay, we stay. Uh, we're going to start some computer programs and you can be the first student. But just at that point, the psychology department changed dramatically and they hired a new, a new chair who was a physicist and brought in a new professor whose degree was in aeronautical engineering and in mathematics. And, uh, and I heard a talk by the chair and I, oh yeah, I can study instead of building machines, I can study this machine that's in the head. And he said, but you don't know anything about psychology, is that right? And I said, right. He said, good, we want you. And uh, that was the beginning. Uh, and I was doing what we call information processing psychology. And uh, my first job was at Harvard, and I was introduced to the faculty at psychology at Harvard. And the, the most famous psychologist in the world at that time was B.F. Skinner, who, after I was introduced, stood up and said, this is a disaster. How come we got this guy? And he denounced me in my field. So that was my beginning in psychology. And actually, I took, I took Skinner's comment as a compliment, because um, I was trying to change the field. Uh, and my next job was at the University of California, San Diego, a new school that had just started. No one had yet graduated. There were maybe 100 faculty members. And we started information processing psychology that became cognitive psychology. And eventually I became chair of the psychology department. But I thought psychology was too narrow. This is a long answer to your question, believe it or not. I thought it was just too narrow because it had its own special. In fact, I don't like the way that academics divides the world up into narrow little disciplines that are called departments. But in each department, there are specialties. So even in a department, there are people who don't understand what the other people in the same department do. And, you know, that's not the way the world works. And the way the world works is you have to go across and you have to know about all sorts of disciplines because you can't just be an expert in one little narrow field because any product, anything you do for use requires knowledge of a wide range of things, including history and politics and finance, business models. So I changed and I, I started first the cognitive science department, one of the first in the world. And, um, and then the Three Mile Island accident happened, it's a nuclear power accident. And I was called in to see why they made such, such errors. And the team I was in decided that the plant was badly designed. If you wanted to cause errors, you couldn't have done a better job. So I realized that design, oh, it requires knowing technology, it requires knowing people, and that's when I became a designer. And so my career has been spent trying to figure out the rules for making things that are easy to understand and easy to use. And that's what the Design of Everyday Things book is all about. Well, that was years ago. The book got published in 1988, and I didn't revise it until 2013, which actually is interesting because I didn't talk about computers in the book. I talked about doors and water faucets and light switches, and those never go obsolete. And the problems we have in designing doors that people could use is still with us today. And the problem of designing stoves where you could actually turn on and off the correct burner all the time, that's still with us today. And so and light switches, there's always a bank of light switches and then you go to Torium and nobody knows which switch does what. So basically you turn them all on or you turn them all off. And had I talked about computers, it would have gotten obsolete right away. But I did modify it in 2013, but now it's 2023. And I've retired a few times. I retired from UC San Diego in 1993, and I went up to Apple and became a vice president. And then I left Apple and did all sorts of other things, and I've retired five times now. So sitting down, what am I going to do now? I decided that, you know, I've had this really varied experience, and then I've been an engineer, I've been a psychologist, I've been a cognitive scientist, I've been a designer, I've been an industry executive. It's time for me to sit back and say, what is really important in the world? What can I do that makes a difference? Because teaching you to make things that are easy to use and easy to understand is important. And it has done a lot of good and improved many of the products that you use. But it's not going to really change the world. And we're facing major issues today. 
And the more I studied those issues, the more I realized what was going on, the more I thought that I was one of the ones guilty for some of the problems because I was helping to design beautiful, wonderful objects without any thought about how we might have destroyed the environment in mining to get the materials to make the exotic materials to make these devices or how we actually manufactured them and produced all sorts of waste products and stuff in the air and stuff on the land and stuff in the sea. Or the fact that we made these, these wonderful devices, you know, like the, this thing, so small and light that you couldn't take it apart. It's very thin because people like thin. It's very, we have a big screen and a narrow, for some reason, the people who review it hate it when there's a big boundary around. But that means any time the phone rings and I pick it up and look, my finger's on the screen. And so it almost, almost always dis disconnects the phone call before I can answer. And, um, but if I want to change the battery, I can't. And we did make it slimmer and the batteries don't last very long. And I always kept saying, if you just made it two or three millimeters thicker, the battery would last a lot longer. And so why can't we make them so they're repairable so they last longer? And so that made me write this book, which I began to realize that the waste that we produce in the design methods that we use have to take into account that we live in this complex world, which is a system where everything is really interconnected. Now, some of the interconnections are very weak and take a long time. But as I point out, if you use your air conditioner, eventually what you've done is you've heated up the atmosphere, which requires you to use your air conditioner more. And you might say, but just my little air conditioner, what could that do? It's not much. Well, first of all, it, where does the heat go when you take it out of your apartment? It, it goes into the atmosphere, but it puts more heat into the atmosphere than it removes from your room because nothing is on as a second law of thermodynamics. Nothing is fully efficient. And on top of that, how did the electricity get generated that you use to run the air conditioner? It's also put more heat into the atmosphere. And there are 3 billion air conditioners in this world. And that starts to make a difference. So that's what this book is about. And uh, it's for the first time I'm saying human-centered design is wonderful if you're designing for a single person or if you're doing a mass product that's going to be used by millions of people and therefore you, uh, you can't design it differently for everybody. But you can manufacture it differently. You can use different materials. And if you're dying to do societal issues, because to me, design is a way of thinking. You can apply it to any problem like public health, like education, like finance, um, and transportation, anything. And so we could use those skills to think about our impact upon all of humanity, not just the individuals that we used to focus on, that I'm responsible for, for this major focus. So the word humanity-centered design follows the same principles and philosophy of human-centered design but on a greater, larger scale. Long answer, I apologize. I do have a tendency to give long answers as you will soon discover. Bill is muted. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, I uh, haven't seen any questions yet. So uh, here's one thing that I'm very interested in. You echo uh, Victor Popinek in your book that everyone is a designer because we all design. So what do you mean by that? How does that work? And what does that mean for what you call also circular design? Yeah, so that's this is the book you're talking about. You can see I use it a lot. Uh, design for the real world. And what's interesting about the book is this, the first book was published in 1971. And here's the very first sentence of the book. There are few, there are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. And actually when I give that sentence, I get rid of the word industrial. I blame all design, not just industrial design. And what does he mean by that? Well, basically he says, because we, we, we build things that people don't need, with, they have to buy with money they don't have in order to impress others who don't care. Um, and, uh, you know, never before in history have grown men 
those days, and women, sat down and seriously designed electric hairbrushes, rhinestone-covered shoehorns, and mink carpeting for bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it was actually a very influential book for me because he was far ahead of his time in which he decried the crap that we were producing and the harm that we were doing to the environment. And um, that's kind of how I started. But he didn't, he didn't have the tools yet to actually convince people sufficiently. And I claim that it's really hard to convince people that they have to think about in broader terms and the result, of course, is our climate change that's happened. And the bad news about climate change is that it's here. It's causing fires and storms and floods and drought. And the good news about climate change is that it's here. It's causing fires and floods and windstorms and drought and hunger. And the reason that's good news is because for the first time, people now realize they have to take it seriously. So now the message is striking home. So Don, um, I got a question here and I would want to combine it with uh, one of mine as well. And this says, uh, since academic departments in universities, I assume, are too narrow, how can students find jobs or careers that integrate double E or CE, I assume that's civil, backgrounds uh, to fields with more design and sustainability focus, like for instance, IDEO, and also combine that with the fact that ETM is a management department and how can, how can students who are going into management or engineering really change the world in these corporations? Why not? Who else is gonna change the world? So look, my students, I, we have a very unusual design group here in San Diego. I, in fact, I was, pulled out of my pleasant fourth retirement. I was living comfortably in Palo Alto. Uh, I enjoyed myself. I was busy. I did not have a job. I did not want a job. And the head of UC San Diego came to my home and begged me to come down and start a new a design group. And I said, no, I'm happy. I don't need a job. Don't want one. He came a second time and finally a third time. And he said, look, you can do anything you want. There's only two conditions. Whatever you do has to be important, and whatever you do has to be exciting. So, well, my wife and I really do like San Diego, and so we said, well, why not? So we went down and did that, but um, what we do is very unusual. And so when you try to get a job in a design department or for a design consultancy like IDEO, and they, they wanted to see your portfolio, and well, what? what's the portfolio? Or I'm a mechanical engineer, and I, yeah, I did some CAD sketches or so on, or I did this little thing, and that, and that doesn't go any place in design. So here's what I tell them, and it has really worked. When you go apply for a design job and say I've taken uh, some design courses, tell them they took, you know, the Design of Everyday Things course because everybody knows that book. And so that says, oh, yeah, you know a little bit. Um, but emphasize that you are not an ordinary designer because there's no way you can compete with people who come out of design schools. There's just no way. They have these beautiful, wonderful portfolios that are beautiful and wonderful to look at. They're probably, by the way, completely irrelevant to the world, but they're beautiful. And you say, I'm an engineer and I know how to build things that really last. I understand the, the materials. I understand um, the complexities of manufacturing and how we have to design to make manage for that. Or you can say, well, I'm really, I'm, I'm really, uh, I studied management. And uh, now here's the trick in management. It's the management that has all the power. And what you have to do though, is get, a, get your entry level job where you're not really gonna be managing people. Because the first job is unlikely to be with a, where you're a manager of a large group of people. If you're lucky, you'll be a management a manager of two or three people, or maybe five. But then you can move up the chain because here's a skill that you have that the traditional designers lack. You understand business. You understand business models. You understand the importance of finance. You understand the importance of, of um, supply chain management. You understand the importance of getting stuff out on time. And you don't want your stuff to be perfect. You can't afford it to be perfect. 
You have to make sure it's, it works well and it's good enough. In fact, I've always thought the best product is the one that is works wonderfully and people love it, but it's lacking a few things that it can't do. That's wonderful. Because if people really love it, then they'll keep this, they'll keep asking you, please, please, please add these other features, and eventually you will. So management is where the power is. And I complain to people who are trained in design that they don't know enough about mechanical engineering, they don't know enough about psychology and people, and they don't know enough about civil engineering, they don't know enough about finance, they don't know enough about management. And if you want to make a difference. And when you get to the point where you ask me about the circular economy and what, what that means, um, the real problem is how do you convince a company to change the entire way they're manufacturing and selling things? Because they're going to complain that, oh, no, that's, this is what we do and we're really good at it. And what you're asking me to do is going to change our products. And on top of that, we won't make any money. It's going to cost us more money. And people, if I make a product that doesn't have to... <laughs> That, you, that lasts for 10 years instead of for two years, well, gee, I mean, my whole company model is based on the fact that I'm selling new products over and over again. So you have to have an answer to that. One thing you learn, by the way, is, is you do not want to go and tell people what the problems are in the company. If you, as, as you get your job and you see what people are making or you see how they're doing things or you see how the manufacturing takes place and you say, oh, that's wrong, do not go to the people in charge and say, this is wrong. Because let me tell you, I, when I was an executive, I did not want somebody coming to me and telling me that we were doing things wrong. And it's not because I didn't want to know. I did need to know. But what I wanted you to do was come and tell me what we should do, what we should do differently. I wanted the solution. And the solution had to be one, though, that fit within the business model. So once again, the designers keep coming to me and they say, oh, we, how come our management doesn't understand us? And I say, well, how do you talk to your management? An important rule in design is understand your customers and speak their language. So how do you talk to your management? Well, we show them the wonderful designs we do and we show letters come in to say they're nice or we win design prizes. And I say, well, if I were the management, I would say, yes, that's very nice. You're doing good work. That's why we hired you. Now, excuse me, but I have to get back to work. What you have to do is you have to come up with new ideas and say, you know, we've been thinking about our product line and here's a new product we think you could, we should be making. That's good, but that isn't enough. Because how do you convince them? You have to convince them that their sales will increase or their, serve, or their costs will decrease and they'll be making more money. And how do you do that? Well, you show them a spreadsheet. Now, the designers always say, well, gee, how do you do that? It's a new product. How would I know how much it's going to sell or what it's going to cost or this, the other? Well, let me tell you, maybe some of you who have taken marketing courses, that's what you learn to do. You learn to do those projections and, and show this, that what, what you're proposing and what it's going to cost and what it's going to sell and so on. And, you, and how do you get those numbers? Well, you lie. You make them up. But, but the important point is this. The executives are not stupid. I know people like to think that executives are stupid or that the department chair is stupid or that the dean is even more stupid and so on. No, they're not. But they have other issues they have to worry about. And so they will make decisions that are not what you would have wanted because they have different pressures on them. So making up those numbers is important. And the executives, that's what they used to do themselves. So they know that they're made up. So they want to know where you made them up from. What assumptions did you make? Are those reasonable assumptions? And if they're reasonable and they see there's some promise in it, um, they may very well say, that's really, thank you very much. And they may go forth with it. But you've got to learn the language of your customer and your customer is your boss. Actually, not really your boss because usually your boss understands you. It's the boss of your boss or maybe the boss of the boss of your boss. Your customer is upper management. And if you do this well, then those of you who want to be managers will rise up the ranks and eventually you will be upper management. And then you will have a much more powerful say in how the company should be doing to business. Well, thank you, Don. I've got two, uh, two more questions here. Great, uh, great dissertation here. 
Uh, one of them is, uh, do you, when it comes to sustainable, scalable designs, what is one memory from your travels as you've gone all over the world uh, that stays with you? If you go to the, the, the terminology, gets, gets, there's a, all sorts of politics today about what we call the, what used to be called the underdeveloped nations, or we sometimes call them the global south, or a, um, and, you know, we call the Western nations and the Eastern and Western and Eastern and Eastern and global North and global South have nothing to do with geography. Australia is part of the global North, for example. Um, but it has to do with basically the, the companies and, and the people that come from the European tradition of logic and sensibility and, and, and the capitalistic system that developed mostly in England but it's been around for a long time, which is the goal is to make a lot of money uh, as opposed to the goal is to make people happy and, and that have better lives. And um, that's pervaded the entire world now though. But when I go to these other countries and especially when I go in the interior of the countries, I see people living very differently and quite often quite happy and quite comfortable. So I've been in uh, Latin America, in Mexico, in places that are far from the development area. I have been in um, El Salvador, again, in places that are far from where normal people live. In the India, I've been to places in India where some of my friends from India who were born and lived and grew up in India, they had never been to the countryside. They just lived in the big cities, so they were unaware of what was happening. So I visited medical clinics in India where you go in, it's a one room clinic and it has no electricity and no running water and no basic equipment, but that's how they live and they manage. And uh, you manage to do this by reusing everything over and over and over again. And so the circular economy, I like to illustrate, I forgot to bring it for this talk by showing you a banana or an orange. And I'm saying, look at the package. It is, it's this nature is packaged in it. When I want to eat the orange, well, I take off the peel. and Or eat the banana, I take off the peel. And I can throw it on the ground afterwards because it will naturally degrade and become fertilizer to allow more plants to grow. Now, there are other things that you can do like that. So uh, I have a, there, you can't see it, a Canon laser printer, which has four expensive cartridges. And I have to replace them several times a year because I write a lot and do a lot of paper. But what Canon does when I buy a new Canon cartridge, they give me this big box with a Canon cartridge in it. And I take out the new one and I take out the old cartridge and I put the old cartridge in the box that the new one came in. And then I seal the box and Canon gives me, a, a, I can print out a sticker and that's so that the UPS will come and pick it up. No charge to me and it goes back to Canon. And Canon says they have completely designed that laser cartridge. So every bit of it can be reused. And uh, yeah, here's another one. So I'm lazy. I'm giving another talk, so I have some of the props there. I'm lazy, and so I use an espresso coffee maker, which is one of those pod coffee makers. See these pods? And uh, you know, when these first came out, people said, yeah, you're going to destroy the environment. You're throwing away all this stuff. Well, not these. Uh, these, the Philips was the company that first developed it. And the Nespresso ones, well, that's case is aluminum. And the easiest thing to recycle is aluminum. Aluminum and metals in general and glass are the easiest things to recycle. And so what they do, what um, they give me a bag. And they say, oh, throw your cartridges into this bag. And when it has about 200, 250 items in it, then seal it up and mail it back to us and we will recycle it. And if I buy it from Pete's Coffee, which I do, Pete's pays for the, pays for the postage. And they say, we remake those into new cartridges and their inside is used coffee grounds. And that's wonderful fertilizer. And we make fertilizer out of it. And I've been in India where they do is they take the stuff that can't be recycled and they have, I was a juror in a design contest and this, this one group of people, they built this huge, incredible machine. 
You just threw all your stuff into it and it compressed it and pressed it and made blocks out of it. So they didn't even decompose the stuff. They just pressed it together and they made blocks, which you could then use to build houses and walls and other things. And that's what the circular economy is about. It's just like nature. Stuff gets reused, not, it's not thrown away. Excellent. Uh, I've got another question here. I'm going to rephrase a bit. Uh, how do you, uh, you've addressed this a little bit with management, but in the case of process, how do you, uh, where, where you have managers who need to keep the lights on and pay the bills, how do you incorporate design thinking and design process and creativity uh, into a corporate environment when you've got people who need to pay the bills? And surely this applies to your circular economy and circular design. How do you how do you do that? <laughs> uh, I, I don't understand what possible contradiction there could be because the real issue is we, when you see a factory that's putting out smoke, waste in the smokestacks and waste in the waters and waste in the air, that's money. All that stuff is going out. And so you say, look, is there some way we can redo the way we're doing things so that we don't waste so much stuff, but actually reuse the stuff that's going out? That's a design problem. Or you want to rethink the organizational structure of a company so that people can actually work together. Because when you have the designers who come up with this idea and they toss it over to the engineers who then have to refine it and, and, and figure out the specs for building, and then the manufacturers have to figure out you know, how to do it. Um, if you go to an automobile company, when the end, my son used to tell me his stories. He, his first job was at Toyota in, in, in Japan. Yes, he had learned to speak. Japanese quite fluently, and he was in new car production, and his job was to be the mediator. They had this new car that was coming off the line, and they were just starting to build them in, as test cases to see if they could build them, and the parts wouldn't fit. And so the, manufacturer, the manufacturing people would blame the engineers for designing it wrong, and the engineers would blame the manufacturing people for manufacturing the part wrong. And I'm sorry, this is the assemblers at the auto that were complaining. Everybody would blame everybody else. And his job was to actually try to figure out how to, they can get going again and stop blaming people. But let's figure out what the real issues are. Well, there's where design thinking comes in. And one of the things you say is we step back and say, what's the real issue here? If you look at the Toyota Motors production system or the Toyota motor line, that's what they do. And again, my son pointed out that his training at Toyota, he, before when he was hired on April 1st, which is where they hire everybody, April 1st, he then went through six months of training before they allowed him to take his job. And he learned how, to, uh, how the automobile was made. He learned how to disassemble an automobile and how to reassemble it. He learned uh, he had to go and spend time in an in a automobile dealership and sell cars. And um, he had to be on the assembly line. And on the assembly line, um, if you made an error and it, and it caused a problem later on, and this happened to him, uh, a guy comes coming walking down the, down the line and says, did you do this? And as my son points out, his immediate response as an American was to say, no, not me. But he knew better. He knew he shouldn't do that. He said, oh, yes, I think I did. The response back was, Good. That's very good. Now, let's let me watch how you work and let's see why that happened. And they would try to find what caused it. And sometimes you made an error because of this what happens. It's not easy. His job was to put on water pumps, but they're doing like eight different automobiles at the same time. And so each time it's coming down the line, you have to decide which automobile this was and then which pump it required and which tools you needed to do it and do that while the thing is still moving and you had not much time to put on the part. And it goes on. And so are there ways we could make this easier for you? Make it more, you get more advanced notice or whatever. And that's what you have to do. You have to learn how to step back and say, what's the fundamental problem? And it doesn't matter whether it's an automobile assembly line or it's uh, trying to solve the health problem. You know, we have epidemics here in San Diego. Almost any problem, by the way, you find in the outskirts of the world, you will find it here in the United States too. We have epidemics, and so 
What do we do? We send in the public health people. We send in the medical people to solve the epidemic. Then we send in the public health people to train people. What caused the epidemic? Bad sanitation. Oh, public health will teach you about sanitation. Well, why is there bad sanitation? Well, there aren't any restrooms and facilities. And why aren't there any? Well, these people are homeless. If you want to change, so if you're a physician, you want to stop the epidemics, it turns out you have to solve the homeless problem. And that itself has many underlying issues, but that's what design thinking is about. It's about trying to dissect the issues. You learn how to solve problems. Engineers are very good at it. Business people are very good at solving problems, but very seldom are you taught to ask, is this the right problem? Uh, Don, I'm going to, I've got three more questions here, but I'm going to jump to the third one because I think it's fascinating. We'll go back to the other two, but it's, uh, I guess, customer involvement at early stages of product development is important. Can you suggest how to gain customer involvement early on and efficiently? And uh, what do you feel about that, getting them involved? I don't think it's important. I think it's essential. You're designing for other people. You have to know what the, how the people work, what they do. And so you, you should always have a group in the company that's always out there going to people's homes and studying and watching. I've done that. I've gone into people's homes and we watch how they do things, we'll ask what, what they're trying to do. We don't ask them what problems they're having because if they just focus on the existing problems, we don't get to the core. What I really want to focus on is what is it your end? What is your end goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And then maybe we'll see that even that the tools are using are the wrong tools. And maybe that's our fault. The tools that we provide them are the wrong tools to do what they really want to do. And uh, I mean, I've gone to, and I've gone to large companies. I've gone to small companies. I went to companies in France, went to companies in Japan, um, went to the Mayo Clinic, where we were trying to convince them to buy Apple computers. Uh, which we discovered would be good within the consulting rooms, but it wouldn't be good for, their, for their most, most of their work because we said, we sell laser printers. You, you have to print out stuff. Well, if you go and watch what they're doing, they, they, the kind of printing they did, we could not handle. But you wouldn't know that unless you went and studied and watched and talked to the people that you're trying to build for. And now when it comes to societal things, I want to change the homeless problem or I want to introduce better public health, or I'm in India or Africa, and they need a new sanitation system. The worst thing I can do is design one for them. They have to do it themselves. You can't come in and be a, you know, we talked about the colonization of the world where the Western powers can and discovered uninhabited lands all around the world and claimed it for their nation. Uninhabited, there were people living there. Uh, and in India, the British came in and said, oh, you don't know how to govern your, your country. We'll govern it for you. That didn't go over well. And just like we, we can't come in and say, here's a problem. Here's your solution. All of the aid programs in the world do that. They send in the experts, the world experts to study. And they say, oh, yes, your sanitation problems are huge. And here are the solution. It will cost you $20 billion. We'll take about 20 years to do. And these always fail because the experts are experts and they understand the problem, but they don't understand the people. They don't understand what people are able to do and how people live their lives. And so they're destroying the way they live their lives in order to do a Western type of solution. No, you should have to let the people do it. So this is going beyond getting customer involvement. This is actually saying, this, we want you to do the design because you're bright, you're intelligent. We don't have to study you to understand what your problems are. You know what your problems are. You also know what your capabilities are. So what we'll be is we'll be mentors and we'll be facilitators and we'll help you. So that's what humanity center design is about, designing by and with your intended uh, clients, not for them. This is interesting, Don, because my summer course on user-centered innovation uses Liz Sanders' uh, textbook. And I first met you in Korea where you and Liz Sanders were on the same docket. And I heard, <clears throat> heard you speak there, first time live, plus Liz. And I'm wondering what you think about her participatory design. 
What I'm talking about is uh, it has many, many different names. And one of them is participatory design. Um, <clears throat> what, what she talked about and what most of the people who do participatory design talk about is very important and useful is you bring in the people to be part of the design process or part of the design team. That's slightly different than, uh, th th I go one more step, which is to say in many ways, people can actually, they've already built rough prototypes and we can see they can work. And so they know how, what they can repair and, and how they can build things. And so we'll, we'll let them do the driving force. But it's, it's basically, there's all sorts of things called co-design and collaborative design, co-design, et cetera. Yeah. The, the people give different names to these things. And participatory design is one of them. But Liz Sanders and the textbook that she wrote with um, my uh, good friend at Delft. Convivial, was, convivial something. Uh, this yes, very, convivial tool. Strange, a strange name. Right. Uh, is excellent and one I highly recommend. Yep. Uh, going back to a <clears throat> previous question about technology, how, you, you mentioned this a lot in your book. Can technology and can design get us out of this mess? And you dealt with that quite a bit. So here's, here's an example. With uh, the climate change issue, with everything trying to move towards elect electrical vehicles and electrical stoves and appliances, I'm wondering about the fact that uh, we may um, tax the grid in America, the power grid, and also things like lithium mining. Are, are we just going to transfer the pollution from one place, cars, to another place? What do you think about that? That's a good design thinking problem. So, first of all, <clears throat> how do we overcome that? Uh, now, one of the problems with electrification is what is going to power the electric plant? Uh, and we're moving towards renewables. And so actually renewables are taking more and more of the power generation in the United States. But, you know, where is the wind strong? We put windmills there. And uh, where is the sun strong? We put, you know, solar there. Where are, do we use a lot of water? We put dams there, hydroelectric. Um, but that isn't necessarily where people live. In fact, it's usually not where people live. So we need big transmission lines and we lose a lot of the energy in the transmission line unless we make them very high voltage and switch them to direct current and then transmit it and then switch it back to AC in a lower voltage. And big transmission lines across the country. Everybody says, well, yes, we need that, but not where I live. It's the not in my backyard, the NIMBY philosophy. So why do we need that? Why, why can't we have solar in the homes? Why can't we have, because solar is, gee, I could put solar on the roof where I live. Uh, and actually where I live, lots of people have solar on the roof. And um, why can't we make small generation plants? So nuclear power is not, uh, one that uh, there's been a lot of emphasis now in the National Academy of Engineering, which I'm a member of, uh, about trying to build small nuclear power plants. So small, they can be on a truck. So you can ship them back and forth. They only give maybe 100 uh, megawatts of power or 1,000, 1,000 megawatts of power, one gigabyte, one gigawatt. That's still pretty small on these things. But you make a truck that can, give, that can carry a 100, 200, 300 megawatt reactor. And OK, if you need more power, we'll simply send more trucks. So you make these modules so they're all the same. Today's nuclear power plants are a disaster. Every one is a monster, a big thing, very difficult to construct, very difficult to get permission, and every one is uniquely designed. So it costs a lot of money because every one is novel and different. You mass produce them. You could have small ones. And not only that, you could have them located near the source that is going to be used, and the power line transmission goes away. Now, that's a difficult problem. To, oh, there's a lot of logistics and a lot of convincing people. And the, st the problem that has not yet been solved in nuclear power is what do you do with the waste? Uh, but there are people working on that. And the pa pa problem with the batteries is, well, lithium is in short supply and lithium and cobalt. Uh, where do you get those materials? And the question is, well, why do you need those materials? You can make a battery out of almost anything. You, know? you can make a battery out of a lemon. Um, and, but they're not as efficient. But okay, so maybe it has to be a bigger battery. 
that maybe it'll last longer, or maybe it'll even be renewed. Re, you know, the lemon I can throw away and it becomes fertilizer. I'm not proposing that we use lemons for power, but um, the uh, but there are solutions that are possible, and uh, uh, one of them is to make power modular in smaller sizes, so they can be located closer to the target. Okay. Uh, the last question here, and I'm going to combine it with one of mine, uh, asked about how can we get systems thinking into our product design? <clears throat> and one aspect, I'm wondering what you think of the I Fix It manifesto, where they're trying to get uh, companies and corporations to make DIY repairable products uh, and repairable systems. What do you think about that? Well, the way we get system thinking of the products is up to uh, a guy named Bill and a guy named Tim. It's up to you guys. It's up to the, the instructors, the teachers, to teach systems thinking in the classes, to teach people about this. Because right now, um, where, where do you learn systems thinking? It's really going to be in engineering courses. And from and your books. <laughs> Well, not my books. My books say it's important, but you're not going to learn it from my books. Because I'm, I'm, I'm giving it a larger scale overview. But you, when you want to learn about it, you have to take a course in systems. Um, so, but it doesn't have to be a complex course. You have to be careful that systems can become incredibly complex mathematics. And in my opinion, they're often the wrong mathematics because the mathematics we use to describe complex systems, and for that matter, biological patterns or even weather patterns, it's usually differential equations. And that's actually already aggregating. Uh, it's an average of, if you want to understand particles and how they move in water, the differential equations are averaging all of these particles. And they don't really, therefore, describe turbulence and other things like that. Not very well. They have to be nonlinear, and that becomes messy. The better models are what are called agent models, agent-directed models, that you, you model each molecule. But then you model a billion of them and how they interact with each other. And today's computers can do that. And But we can model systems and we can show the impacts. And, and we can show that we can also have simple models of systems to try to show how it all fits together. And then more detailed models as we go into the local area. Um, and it's, but that's what we'll have to be taught. And for a, the other answer is how do, what do we can do to solve all these issues? And I, say, I talk to the students in the audience and I say, that's your job. We messed it up and it's your job to fix it. But maybe we can give you some of the tools in our courses that will help you make progress. Uh, Don, one of the things you uh, mentioned, and this is um, uh, a leadership question at the end, but also one of the things you mentioned in your book is this whole thing about changing the psychology and perception of new things, uh, not just in management, which is a problem that you've mentioned, but also for customers. How do we how do we change the perception? I mean, you know, back in the 50s, they had fins on cars and that was the best thing to to get. And uh, Popinek talks a lot about that. So how do we since your PhD is in uh, cognitive thinking and psychology, how do we approach changing that perception? Is it a marketing issue? Is it a sales issue? What is it? It's all of the above. The, um, the automobile industry is responsible for a good deal of these issues because, you know, Henry Ford just made one car and just one color. And he, as far as he was concerned, it should last and that would do it. But, but as a new other companies, and when the small companies that banded together to form General Motors came in, they started to make cars with different colors and different sizes and shapes and different abilities. And so that's when the automobile industry became more competitive. And pretty soon they developed this notion of planned obsolescence. And they, you can plan obsolescence in several ways that... Uh, <clears throat> You know, the story that, again, the Ford Motor Company looked at the cars that had broken down and were being thrown away, basically. And they want, they studied all the parts and they wanted to know which ones were still, which ones worked and which ones broke and caused the car to fall apart. But the, the story that's told is that someone said, oh, that's very interesting. So the ones that break are the ones you want to make more strong. 
And the answer is no, 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 no. It's the ones that didn't break, we can make weaker. We can save money on it because we want them all to break at the same time, right? There's a famous poem about that. But, um, but so first of all, you can make it play an obsolescence because it breaks down. But second of all, you can make it because, oh, new technology has come. And so you want to take advantage of all the new things we can do. Or you want to say it goes out of fashion. And the fins are fashion. And they're what you did, what the companies do is they, they make the same car because it's very expensive to tool a factory to do a car. So they make the same car four or five years and then they change it dramatically. And then you can tell that, oh, that's you make a new car and that's an old car. How come you're driving an, an old car? Well, why don't we change it so that it's you take great pride in driving a car? Great pride in that I've had this car for 15 years and it's gone. It's gone now 200,000 miles. Uh, and uh, as opposed to great pride, I just bought a brand new car. And, you know, in my life, I always, I've bought lots of new cars, but I, but each car I had, I owned for 10 years. And I just sold my 10 year old car, even though it was working perfectly fine, but here's planned obsolescence. <laughs> um, I'm getting old and I know the state of R on my reaction time and so on. And so I wanted the, all the new safety features because there's been huge advances in safety over the past 10 years. So I bought a new car with all the new safety features, but I, this will be the last car I'll ever buy. And uh, it's an electric car and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it's unfortunately too powerful. I used to own a Porsche and I had to sell it because I said, I'm, the problem with this Porsche is I enjoy it too much. <laughs> and uh, so I sold it because, again, I knew how old I was getting and I shouldn't be driving it. But this new car goes from zero to 60 miles an hour in three seconds or so. And who, why? Do, why? That's so stupid. I'm not a race car driver, but it does. It is, in fact, it is amazing what it can do and the safety features. For those of you who care, it's a BMW i4. Um, and uh but I hope that I will keep this car and I hope that they're starting to make electric cars where we can, and they're starting to now learn how to take the batteries and disassemble them and reuse the components in those batteries. And you, even then you can use them before the, you get rid of the battery, you can change the battery and the old batteries are still pretty good batteries. They're just not good enough to power your car, but you can put them in your home as a storage to battery. So if you had solar in your home, you power the battery. And when there's no sun, you can use the battery or the, but the power line fails, you use the battery. So that's how I think we're going to change things. Um, so, but a lot of things have changed in this world. Uh, take a look at giving women the vote. It used to be thought preposterous that women were capable of voting. But in, in the United States, it took over a hundred years to get women the permission to vote. And guess what? The world didn't fall apart. And now women have, are in fact are in control. Many women are CEOs. Many women have run for president or running or certainly are in the Senate. Not enough, but we're getting there. And so we can change a lot of things. The notion of homosexuality was considered so forbidden that people were not allowed to talk about it. And that has changed dramatically in years. So I think we can change the philosophy of, of always having something brand new to being proud of the fact that I've let, kept this car for 20 years, or um, I don't have to buy the latest new clothes. Or if you do want to wear new clothes for every new affair, uh, because the fashion industry is all about fashion, uh, well, why not rent it for that one time I'm going to wear it and then give it back to the rental place and let someone else wear it? And that's already happening, by the way. You can rent formal clothes. Men have always rented their tuxedos, but women can now rent their fancy gowns as well. So, uh, Tim, do we have time for one more? Okay. Sure. Yes, go for it. Uh, here's, here's one that has just come up recently that I'm uh, wondering about. Elon Musk and uh, some others have uh, raised concern about artificial intelligence, especially with chat GPT and others. And I'm just wondering what you think, uh, you've mentioned this in some of your papers, in some of your books, and in this new book as well, uh, about humans and AI working together. So how do you think AI is going to affect 
design, circular design, the design uh, circular economy, uh, and technology in general? Well, first of all, when you say AI, you have to realize it covers a huge number of different kinds of technologies. I point out that we all use AI again in this phone system. But I first uh, started developing the AI phones and things. I said, these phones, the cameras will never be any good. They're fine for amateurs, but they'll never give you high quality photos. And it's very simple why, it's a law of physics because you have a very small receptor. And so each cell can only get lucky if it gets a photon or two. And so that's not enough to give you a sharp picture. And I, that was true, by the way. But if you look at today's photos, oh my God, I, in fact, I threw away my cameras a long time ago. I just used this camera. And, but it's AI that's made the difference. Uh, and it's done it in several different ways. One of them is that when you take a picture, it doesn't just take a picture. It might take 10 pictures really fast. But, but, you don't even know it, but therefore that's basically like making the area 10 times greater. So it has a chance to capture, capture more photons. And second of all, it can do, you can do smoothing and it has pattern recognition that can enhance the color, it can enhance the contrast, enhance boundaries. And so that's one version of AI. And you notice that it also does pattern recognition It puts a little square around the faces of the people you're trying to take a picture of. That's actually neural networks that do that. And so the neural networks now have become very powerful, huge powerful, so powerful there are a billion connections, literally a billion different parameters, connections inside of them. And they got, they got really good at translating languages. I use it all the time when I get foreign notes in, in different languages. Um, and the chat though is interesting because it's, it fools you into thinking it's very intelligent because what it does is it figures out the most likely words to follow one another. And it comes out with cohesive, wonderful, smooth prose, better than most people can write. But it doesn't have any sense of importance. It doesn't have a good memory, so it forgets stuff that it said in the beginning. And when it's picking up the logical words, it sometimes it's putting together things that are completely false. But it says it in such a way that you think that must be true. But it, it's still very powerful and useful if you realize it's like asking a friend for help, a friend who's brilliant, but sloppy. And so you go to this friend because you get lots of good ideas, but you know anything this friend tells you, you better check, <laughs> check it out. And that's what this new tool is. And I'm reminding people it's only about six months old to the public. Now, we started that in my laboratory in, in La Jolla, in UC San Diego, when one of my postdoctoral fellows, a man named Jeff, Jeff Hinton, uh, took the chalk out of my hand and said I was wrong what I was saying and went on to describe some of the new work coming out of England. And pretty soon he and my colleague, David Rumelhart, invented a multiple layer network of neurons and uh, developed this. And so Jeff Hinton went on to invent deep learning and then he's developed the chi of GPT, the transformer algorithm. And uh, I met him at, at Google uh, a few years ago because he had started a company and Google bought it. And, um, and I asked him, what was the breakthrough? And he says, there wasn't any breakthrough, no, no theoretical breakthrough. The real breakthrough was the computers of today are 10,000 times more powerful than the computers we started with. But it had, it's really like your subconscious. It's finding things that fit together into nice patterns. And then it interrupt, but in, the, in, the, in us, Poincaré, the mathematician, once said that's how his mind works. But it, his subconscious interrupts him with, an, hey, I have a new idea. And, but the subconscious can't do arithmetic and can't do fact checking or anything. So he has to laboriously check to see if it makes sense. And most of the time it doesn't. But when it does, it's a dramatic breakthrough. And that's what I say about AI. And I just, for the other day, I was trying to find an old quotation and I, and I asked Chad and it couldn't find it. I checked several times over and over again. It came close, it came close. I, and I've been searching for the source of this quotation for years and I couldn't find it either. So I know it's hard. And, um, but along the way, it gave me a paper. It, it, it's nowadays it cites where, what I should look at. And so I looked at that paper and I said, this has nothing to do with the question I'm asking. 
But wait a minute. I was asking about attention span, and this is a new paper on a new theory of attention. And I said, I, that's an amazing paper. Now, I told this to somebody who says, don't, don't, <laughs> chat makes up citations. And I said, I know that. But so I went and followed the citation, and I found the paper published in Nature magazine, which is one of the hardest magazines to get published in. And it's very authoritative, and it's very impressive. And they equate attention and working memory are essentially the same concept, he said, they said. And so that's how I use it. And I also use it when I'm writing something. When you write a paper, you also have to write an abstract. Don't you hate writing the abstract? It comes at the end and you have to do it because you're required. Ask Chad to do it. And I've done that. I, I took a paper from some friends and I had, I said, chat, summarize it in 200 words, which is a requirement of the abstract. And I sent it to my friends and said, that's a pretty good summary. And they said, yes, it is, but it missed the most important part of the paper. And I said, look, the hard part about writing an abstract is getting started. So this gets you started. Now you can go and refine it. And you can give it back to chat and say, see if you can make it better and do it several times. But also, so chat missed the most important part of the paper. You Maybe you want to take another look at your paper. Maybe you didn't emphasize it enough. So that's how I want to use chat as a collaborator and as an untrustworthy creative collaborator. But by the way, all the problems we know about chat, everybody knows about them. And Jeff Hinton, he's, uh, he's considered now the godfather of modern neural networks. Uh, he just left Google because he wants to be able to speak his mind about what we should do. Yeah. Google stopped him. But he says, I, I felt the more constrained, but he's, I'm against stopping the work. Because what we must do is actually increase the work on this to attack the kinds of problems that it's leading us to. And, but, to but to emphasize the virtues of these new tools. Now, generative tools in AI, I'm sorry, generative tools in design have been with us a long time. Yeah. Autodesk has been selling generative uh, design tools for quite a while. And they're very powerful and very useful. So it's just like when the calculator came in, people said, oh, gee, People will use a calculator, they won't learn arithmetic anymore. Well, gee, I said, when I was a student, I had to solve complex problems that would take a week to solve. And nobody in the class ever got them right. Not because we couldn't understand them, because in a week of calculation, you made mistakes. Yeah. So now I can give a calculus, I can give a differential equation to my computer and it will solve it for me. And that's okay, because solving a differential equation is not what mathematics is about. What mathematics is about is thinking of what the equation should be in the first place, and whether that really describes the problem you're working on. And because the tools can handle the grunt work, I can actually be more creative. Absolutely. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Tim, because I think our cutoff time is 420. Is that right, Tim? Yeah, it's but um, fortunately, we don't have any uh, hard gate closing on us at 420. Okay. But the uh, but this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, great contributions in the chat. It, it's been great seeing the people that are uh, joining our uh, meetings, such as our founding department chair, Dr. Kakaglua, um, um, one of our most recent PhD graduates, uh, a senior vice president and uh, chief information officer for OHSU, Dr. Bridget uh, Barnes, and uh, Dr. Wolf Pinfold. And so a lot of uh, great people that uh, came in here. And I liked the uh, ending discussion talking and bringing it back to the AI that everybody's talking about now. It just reminds me of the quote from Steve Jobs about a computer being the bicycle for the mind. And the idea that now the large learning language model systems are even more powerful bicycles for the mind, um, perhaps a motorcycle or something. And so tools for, uh, that we can use in, in ways as you talked about. Um, again, thank you very much for coming, uh, speaking here. If these are triggering ideas, insights, passions, you're more than welcome to follow up on that in uh, Bill's summer class, user-centered innovation, and um, the discussion about designers uh, uh, having challenges with uh, financial projections just speaks to even the ETM program where we teach technology marketing as a core part where every 
um, every person ends up adding those skills in uh, to try to help do that. The engineering economics, the financial modeling, and design is something that everybody needs as well. So thanks again, uh, Bill and Don. This has been wonderful and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Don. I'll follow up with you uh, after this. Okay, and I'd like to thank the audience and for those very nice questions. Excellent. Thank you. Bye.